participants and uh, to Professor Gao uh, and Professor Song, who are organizers of this colloquium. It's a pleasure for me uh, to present here our uh, work on uh, quantum sensing using NV centers in diamond. Um, and uh, so here on the first slide, you already see something that give you a, a, a feeling of this experiment where you see a piece of diamond that will be used in an experiment involving coherent controls. That's why you see here some microwave lights. So you will learn a little bit more about this later. Uh, but uh, let me uh, start with a bit uh, uh, more general motivation. Uh, and I will basically uh, highlight that uh, physics, uh, not only quantum physics, but physics in general, uh, contributed very essentially to uh, tools for uh, biomedical sciences. So quantum sensing is quant and quantum imaging is not like a, a, you know, a isolated field. Also classical sensing and classical imaging is based on, um, on physics principle and uh, biophysics, biochemistry, medicine, and nowadays um, is based essentially on uh, advanced tools developed by physics. And today we are going to talk about how quantum physics can contribute to this field, to biosensing uh, and uh, bioimaging at uh, nanoscale. Um, when talking about uh, sensing at nanoscale uh, biomolecular structure recognition, I would like to highlight two techniques that are, uh, are very commonly used nowadays. One is uh, fluorescence microscopy. Uh, so this technique is very sensitive. Um, nowadays, you can image single molecules uh, in cells, like here you see GFP that is uh, introduced in, uh, in, uh, in a cells and you can image it with a sensitivity up to single molecule level and with advanced microscopy techniques with special resolution down to 10 nanometers. Uh, it's fast technique, can operate with a video rate but it has some limitations and limitations are related to the fact that you always image a label. So you image uh, the GP molecule and not necessarily protein you're looking for. Uh, so this is something that is missing in this technique. So you always are uh, related uh, to ability to label uh, your biomolecule. Another uh, somehow a complementary technique is uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, both in both modalities, spectroscopy and imaging. Uh, so nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy is a technique which is a bit different from microscopy uh, in a visible light regime. Uh, namely, it uses uh, spectroscopic resolution to get information about the structure of the molecule. Uh, individual nuclear spins composing protein interacts with, with each other and these interactions give the uh, this very rich structure of the spectra and this rich structure allowed to rec reconstruct the three-dimensional picture uh, of uh, biomolecules. Uh, this technique is very powerful and is label free but uh, it's uh, not very sensitive so far so conventional techniques does not allow to, uh, to sense a single biomolecules using, using this approach. And uh, sensitivity uh, problem was recognized already by pioneers in NMR. So actually uh, for standard technique, you need about 10 to the 12 spins at least, or so billions and billions of copies of the same molecules. And this low sensitivity are related to um, essentially two main uh, factors. One is uh, relatively high noise in detection coil. In this case, of conventional NMR, you detect uh, induction produced by nuclear spins. And the second is the relatively low polarization of uh, nuclear spins and the ambient condition, even in high magnetic fields. Uh, only one nuclear spin out of million contribute uh, to a signal. And combination of this noisy detector and relatively low polarization uh, give rise to these uh, limits 
uh, in uh, sensitivity. And those are two very known uh, challenges and the community already started to address these challenges since quite a time by developing better detectors, including squids, magnetometers, atomic magnetometers as NMR detectors, and also introducing so-called hyperpolarization, increasing polarization of the sample. Um, I will touch these two topics today in context of applications of um, NV centers and coherent control. I will show how uh, quantum technologies can contribute um, to this field. So our NMR detection technique will be using uh, quantum uh, sensors of magnetic fields. And in our lab, we are working with uh, color centers in diamonds. So diamond uh, is not only um, a very hard material uh, having very wide band gap, but also host a lot of uh, color centers. And some of them like NV centers in diamond can be used as atomic magnetometer. If you approach this magnetometer very close to spin of interest, uh, you can detect magnetic interaction between uh, your uh, sensor spin and spin of interest. And that's the basis of our technique. In this technique, in this approach, you need to get very, very close uh, to, the, uh, to the nuclear spin of interest you want to measure. Uh, so why NV centers in diamond are interested, interested in this respect? Um, NV center uh, consisting of nitrogen and vacancy in the next latest position have a unique um, energy level structure with ground state triplet and excited triplet three uh, state triplet spins and these uh, states are connected by strong optical transitions. Um, one of the state is brighter in fluorescence than to others, allowing to detect the state of the spin of NV center. In addition, in the, the NV center can be very efficiently polarized by uh, optical excitation. And uh, this combination of uh, uh, non-zero spin in a ground state and accessibility of spin using optical excitation give a unique tool uh, to uh, implement uh, in V-centers as element of uh, magnetometers. Just to uh, give you a feeling how this experiment look like, uh, I show you the uh, picture confocal picture, microscopy picture of array of NV centers. Every dot here is a fluorescence of a single NV center. So you can detect these color centers with uh, um, ultimate sensitivity and a single site uh, basis. And uh, importantly, also you can implant them very close to diamond surface, uh, allowing this uh, nanoscale nuclear magnetic resonance experiments we're going to discuss a bit later. So how experiments look like, you do have a confocal microscope, uh, array of implanted in view centers, you excite your color centers with laser, you detect fluorescence using uh, very sensitive uh, avalanche photodiodes. Uh, in addition, in our experiments, we apply microwave to control the spin states of single defects and the simplest experiments you can uh, show here to demonstrate spin control and readout is a scan of microwave frequency and measurements of fluorescence intensity. Once you hit with your microwave resonance between uh, two spin states, your fluorescence uh, changes indicating the redistribution of populations between um, spin states. So remember, one of the spin states is brighter than others. So when you redistribute the population, you get a change in fluorescence intensity, you get change in brightness of these uh, color centers. And this is essentially uh, basic of such a sensing experiment that can be turned in more sensitive fashion as uh, we will discuss a bit later. This is how uh, experimental setup or its heart look like piece of diamond, this microwave line and in V centers are implanted here between uh, this uh, strip line carrying microwave and imaging is done here from the top. Well, um, 
let's discuss in a bit more details uh, how this magnetometry experiment look and uh, how sensitive this magnetometer can be. First of all, uh, in V-Center spectroscopy uh, is uh, essentially naturally connected to magnetometry experiments by measuring the evolution of spin states in a magnetic field. Uh, you can reconstruct the field strengths and in some cases even vector uh, orientation of the magnetic field uh, if you know the magnetic moment of in V-Center and this is well known. So that by measuring the frequency or the energy separation, between spin state, you can recognize uh, or you can reconstruct the, uh, the magnitude of the magnetic field. And so if you measure this optically detected magnetic resonance spectra and measure precisely the frequency of your transitions, you can uh, essentially uh, learn the magnetic field. You can do it because very high special resolution at nanoscale because you can work with single NV centers. Uh, you can also uh, do it quite precisely and the precision of the, uh, of the frequency determination, which is connected to sensitivity uh, of the magnetic field measurements is related to uh, line width or the coherence time. So the sharper are these lines, the better you can measure magnetic field or in more general terms, the longer is the coherence time of your uh, spin system, the better quantum sensor you can uh, construct. So there are also some relations that are well established nowadays. Uh, namely, if you want to measure perturbation uh, on a, a spin Hamiltonian, um, uh, you can connect the precision uh, of this perturbation with uh, coherence time and number of measurements as well as number of atoms. And uh, in the best case, your scaling is, if you apply multiple measurements, is one hour square root of uh, coherence time. The longest coherence time, the, as a better sensitivity you can achieve. For a single in V center, the sensitivity can be as good as um, a few nano Tesla per square root of Hertz. And that's because coherence time is uh, relatively long even under ambient conditions. So here you see the free induction decay or Ramsey fringes of a single um, in V center at 300 Kelvin ambient conditions. And you see that you can preserve phase memory time for hundreds of microseconds. And that's pretty long for electron spin um, that uh, also allow quite sensitive measurements at uh, nanoscale. Comparing this with other magnetometers existing uh, uh, so far, uh, I would like to highlight you, and this is uh, the uh, citation from a review article of uh, my colleague, uh, Morgan Mitchell, uh, that uh, there are essentially two figures of merit for uh, such magnetometers, in, in, especially in context of, uh, of sensing, is a, a sensitivity, which is here on Y X, and uh, a dimension of magnetometer, which also give you the uh, special resolution. So the best magnetometers are somewhere here in this corner, which have the best sensitivity, so lowest noise and uh, uh, best special resolution. And uh, uh, so far the best magnetometers in terms of sensitivity, for example, atomic vapor magnetometers, can reach fantastic sensitivities um, better than a femtotesla. Also, squids are very good in this respect, but those are relatively large, uh, and it's hard to uh, apply them on such a nanoscale single molecule uh, sensing scenarios. Uh, in V centers, have a nano nano tesla uh, sensitivity as we discussed before, uh, but have very small dimensions and uh, they basically allow you to come to a regime of a few nanometers um, special resolution. So single molecule size uh, in a special resolution and that's a dream of uh, these bio sensing applications. Right, example of this uh, magnetometers, uh, um, I would like to highlight one experiment which give you example of application 
Uh, it is experiment that was uh, realized in collaboration with Mikhail Lukin Group, uh, Hong Kong Park Group, and Ron Wolfsburg Group in Harvard uh, this time. And uh, it is experiment uh, devoted to sensing of a protein uh, using NV center located just a few nanometers apart for, from a protein. Remember, protein carry nuclear spins and they create a, a processing magnetic field at location of NV center. This oscillating magnetic field can be detected by NV magnetometers um, and uh, now be used as a channel to detect a single uh, protein. So the experiments uh, also includes, of course, a few preparation steps. We need to bring these uh, proteins to the surface of diamond, uh, and that is done uh, using a chemical link uh, based on carboxy groups. And here you see the picture of diamond before and after uh, attachment of a protein. It's an IFM microscopy picture. It's a dense layer of proteins that you get after attachment. But remember that your in V center is so close to the surface that it does see only one single uh, protein molecule. And so this is this uh, very short distance is a basis of a nanoscale uh, special resolution here. In order to detect spectrum, remember NMI is a spectroscopy technique. So we need to measure the precession frequencies of nuclear spin. Uh, we have modified a little bit magnetometry protocol, uh, putting pi pulses acting on um, NV center spin, and these pi pulses uh, refocus unwanted components of magnetic field, leaving only one single frequency component uh, where NV center is sensitive to. Uh, this create kind of analog of optical spectrometer or optical spectroscopy grating where the distance between uh, grating traces give you the frequency that you detect here, the distance uh, in time between pi pulses give you detected frequency. And with this um, control of our pi pulses, you can also select or scan the frequency sensitivity region of your NV center uh, magnetometer, allowing you to measure spectrum. So this is echo-based technique, allowing you to turn in V center magnetometer to kind of a spectrum analyzer. And here are examples of spectral lines of uh, uh, protein uh, uh, spins, uh, protein nuclear spins uh, now detected using NV center magnetometer. Quite noisy signals. Uh, at first glance, but remember, this is now a single molecule sensitivity, not a micromolar uh, sensitivity. So it's the ultimate sensitivity, and it's very exciting news that you can now use in this uh, quantum control technique and uh, nanoscale sensors reach regime where you can uh, measure, detect a single uh, protein uh, under ambient conditions, uh, not in vacuum, but sort of. Uh, 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 ambience uh, compatible, and we think that this um, field will uh, develop and now will give new insight into molecular structure and dynamics. There is, however, of course, a long way to go to uh, answer open questions in biology, not only to demonstrate detection of single proteins, namely in order to, uh, uh, to measure unknown structures of proteins, you need to reach very high uh, spectral resolution in your uh, quantum sensing spectrometry. And you also need to reach much better uh, sensitivity to be able to measure dynamics of this molecule, the vibrations and conformational changes. And that's uh, essentially the, the big challenge and our goal to improve these two key parameters, uh, namely uh, spectral resolution and uh, sensitivity. And uh, so this is basically ongoing work. Um, I would like to give you a very recent uh, development in this field, uh, namely um, uh, demonstration of uh, hyperpolarization. So enhancement and sensitivity uh, using this technique uh, in context of NVCENT. And here I would like to give you one more 
uh, detail about this NMR using in vCenter. All initial experiments have been uh, have been realized using noise spectroscopy. So we we were detecting spin noise coming from a protein, and the spin noise was originating from statistical fluctuations of number of uh, spin polarized up and polarized down. So the signal is not depending on the magnetic field, which is a good news. But in some cases, especially in cases where molecules are uh, fluctuating or uh, diffusing um, through the sensing volume, this leads also to change of phase of these uh, molecules. And this change of phase going on all the time also lead to line broadening. So although you are very sensitive, you can detect um, a few or even a single molecule, your lines are broadened uh, in some cases by diffusion. A uh, more conventional way to detect uh, NMR is uh, uh, detection of a thermal polarization, but that's usually a very weak signal. So you apply a pi half pulse, and then you detect the signal, but then the phase is stable. So it has basically advantage to have a narrower line width. And uh, uh, in our labs, we are trying to uh, combine these two approaches now, go from a statistical polarization, from detecting fluctuating spins to detecting a real polarization, but also improve the amplitude of this real polarization uh, signal by transferring polarization from in vicinity and diamond to uh, external spins. And uh, there are also developments uh, in this field, not only in our labs, but also uh, in other uh, groups. Uh, for example, in a group of Franz Walsworth, uh, the, uh, the demonstration of hyperpolarization, of transfer of polarization from electron spins to nuclear spins, and then detection of this polarization and MR signals associated with hyperpolarized spin was demonstrated recently. Um, that increased the signal by um, quite a significant factor about order of magnitude, allowing to detect uh, nuclear spins more efficiently. So this experiment was done uh, um, on a mesoscopic ensemble of spins. Uh, and in this case, the uh, source of polarization was not in V center, but uh, another uh, spin radical. So in our, in our lab, we are pursuing an approach where we try to uh, use in V center in two roles. One is to polarize now uh, nuclear spins outside and then detect them. So basically, first you polarize in V center, then you um, transfer polarization from optically oriented in V center to nuclear spins, and then you detect these uh, polarized spins again using the same in V center. And uh, here we do have a strong collaboration with a team of uh, Martin Plenier at Siri uh, uh, department at own university and here you see how this experiment look like we have a liquid on the top and we have a in v centers implanted very close to this liquid and now we're going to try to polarize this external liquids using in v center electron spins um, polarization itself it's uh, uh, the process that is not trivial uh, polarization transfer between electron spin and nuclear spin is not energetically uh, uh, favorable uh, if you don't uh, match them in energy. So we are now looking on flip-flop process. So we want to uh, flip the electron spin, so lose its polarization, and then flip the, the nuclear spin that will gain the polarization. And in order to do this uh, efficiently, you need to have energy of the electron spin and nuclear spin to be matched. And this is done in NMR, uh, typically by so-called Hartmann-Hahn condition, where you drive your NV center electron spin uh, with a Rabi frequency that matches nuclear spin Larmor frequency. In this case, the rest states of the uh, electron spin are getting resonant with uh, nuclear spin state. And in this case, in this stress state basis, you can get efficient polarization transfer. And here you see 
uh, example of this experiment uh, performed now on NV center, where we change the Rabi frequency of NV center uh, and see the efficiency of its polarization loss and, uh, and conditions where Rabi frequency is much in Larmor frequency of nuclear spin, in this case about 2.8 megahertz. Uh, we do have resonance between these two spin systems and we have polarization transfer from the cold spins and we send the electron spins to warm spins, uh, nuclear spins surrounding it. You know, this process can be used uh, for polarization transfer uh, from NV center to uh, nuclear spins. Now, how fast we can do it? Remember, NV center is very close to the interface, uh, just a few nanometers. And so we did this experiments time resolved. And for two different depths of NV centers, 3.2 nanometers and 5.3 nanometers. And you can see this uh, polarization transfer process happens at 10, 20 microsecond time scale, uh, uh, leaving us a uh, good possibility to polarize many, many nuclear spins within relatively short time. So a single NV center can be used as a polarization source for many uh, nuclear spins. Uh, this uh, polarization transfer sequence is uh, well known and uh, very efficient, but it's also very sensitive to experimental imperfections, um, namely detuning, for example, of microwaves. So if microwaves are detuned a bit, it changes generalized travel frequency and it might lead to mismatch of this Hartmann-Hahn uh, resonance. So we also work on uh, making this uh, coherent control tools more robust. And one of them is uh, echo-based technique instead of uh, this continuous drive uh, developed by uh, Martin Plenio group, where uh, spin echo was used to engineer flip-flop Hamiltonian between uh, electron spin and nuclear spins. And that's essentially refocus also unwanted imperfections, uh, making it much more robust with respect um, to uh, experimental uh, errors. And here I show you the example of this uh, polarization transfer resonance um, for Hartmann-Hahn condition shown in blue and for pulse polarization transfer sequence, this echo sequence shown in a red. And you see that uh, the blue curve is uh, uh, very narrow, means that small mismatch, small detuning between your NV center and the driving field already lead to dramatic loss in polarization transfer efficiency. And for polarization uh, enhanced uh, by a pulsed echo se uh, sequence, you have very broad resonance uh, allowing you uh, to be uh, yeah, efficient also, also for the case where you have some imperfections uh, in your uh, frequency matching or microwave drive power stability. And this all basically get refocused by this uh, uh, optimized polarization transfer sequence. Um, so that's about transfer and polarization from NV center to nuclear spins. And uh, the next step is also to detect these nuclear spins, detect these uh, polarized spins. Uh, and this is a very recent experiment that I would like to share with you. And it was uh, performed in collaboration with Envision. Uh, the company focused on ultra-sensitive NMR and MRI located in Ulm and also associated with our teams here. Uh, and this experiment is essentially very similar to that I have discussed before, but now we are going to use NV centers not only to polarize, but also to detect polarized nuclear spins. In order to do it, we also need to uh, apply pi half pulses to this nuclear spin in order to induce this uh, 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 notations of, uh, of a block vector of um, external uh, nuclear spins. In order to enhance the signals, we are not using a single NV centers, but uh, very thin layers of NV centers here. Uh, so it's a mesoscopic ensemble 
of NV centers that is used to polarize and to detect uh, nuclear spins outside of diamond. Um, first of all, I show you a basic of this experiment. So now, differently to uh, experiment before, where we are using spin uh, noise uh, as detectable signal, we are now applying by half pulse radio frequency pulse and detect this uh, signal using in V centers first. For non-polarized case, this is still a stochastic signal associated with uh, nuclear spins. And now as a second step, we tune our pulse sequence to be sensitive only to real oriented, real polarization oriented nuclear spins. And uh, by varying the phase of this RF pulse, we can estimate uh, the polarization of external spins. So this uh, phase sensitivity to RF pulse is proportional to real polarization of external spins and experiments were performed in very low magnetic field so there is no really thermal polarization all polarization that you do see here is associated with uh, polarization that was gained by this nuclear spins uh, following transfer of polarization from in v centers in diamonds and that's basically very important second element in this uh, experiment so using v centers in both roles as detector, but also as a source of polarization. Now, how big is this polarization is a very important question. And in our experiment so far, we were quite limited in, uh, in uh, efficiency of polarization uh, that we were able to detect. So here's a polarization in percent versus polarization time, uh, interaction time between NV centers and this external nuclear spins. And we do see that uh, we reach about 0.1% of polarization, uh, still much lower than even the st that statistical polarization is. And we think that uh, spin diffusion and uh, some processes like uh, spin noise at interface might play a role here. And we are working hard to improve this. We expect that uh, a few percent polarization uh, can be achievable. And uh, so this is uh, ongoing uh, work that is uh, now uh, yeah, we pursue in our labs. Um, as a last uh, um, topic uh, uh, to touch, I would like to introduce now applications of this quantum sensing, not only for nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, but also for MRI imaging. And you know, it's very important uh, technique in uh, medical uh, applications, um, allow you image non-invasively uh, density of nuclear spins in our body. But again, it's not very sensitive technique. Uh, so it's not yet competitive to PET, for example. Uh, and current, um, standard approach to improve sensitivity in NMR, but also in MRI is always to go to higher and higher magnetic fields to increase the polarization of nuclear spins. Uh, but there are some limits in, in this. And uh, of course, there are some limits uh, of the magnetic fields that you can reach with uh, superconducting magnets. And so we um, have proposed and pursue experiments towards applications of NV centers uh, as sources of uh, hyperpolarization to improve an MR signal, but also to use uh, nanodiamonds with intrinsic nuclear spin as markers for MRI imaging. So the main idea here is to take a nanodiamond carrying uh, NV centers, um, also functionalize it with uh, uh, antibodies to target certain proteins, uh, polarize first electron spins inside of nanodiamonds and then transfer it to carbon-13 nuclear spins inside and then inject this into body and image this uh, nanodiamonds as MRI kind of a signal or contrast agent. And first experiments towards this goal have been performed first in a bulk diamond so we took a piece of diamond carrying uh, NV centers and polarized carbon nuclear spins inside 
using this Hartmann Hahn resonance we have discussed before, and then transfer the diamond to MRI scanner and image it uh, in, uh, in a, a standard imaging mode of the scanner, increasing the signal compared to thermal polarization by about a factor of 100. And that's lead to a 10,000 time improvement in uh, data acquisition time to reach same signal to noise ratio. And this is collaboration with a group of uh, Volker Rasche at uh, Ulm University Medical Center uh, MRI facility. Yeah, and this is, uh, of course, a very first step towards this goal. It's still a large piece of diamond, not yet nano diamonds. So, so we are working on making these diamonds smaller and smaller. Here you see diamond powder, nano powder, carrying NV center. This powder with a pink color was uh, initially having a nitrogen shown in the left, given a yellow color, and then part of nitrogen was converted to NV centers, given this pink color. And uh, we are working to uh, now transfer this technology to experiments in nano diamonds. Of course, here there can be some uh, challenges and uh, there's a chaotic orientation of NV centers. So new protocols need to be developed, but, but we hope that this technique will allow to increase the sensitivity of MRI imaging and make it compatible uh, with uh, so-called molecular imaging standard. And here I also again show you um, the uh, sensitivity of this technique or target sensitivity of this technique compared to other existing techniques. So it's a sensitivity versus special resolution again. And the golden standard of um, molecular imaging is a PET having uh, sensitivity on the order of 10 to the minus 11 molar current MRI is about 10 to the minus four molar. And with this hyperpolarization, uh, polarization transfer technology, we hope to improve the sensitivity of uh, MRI by orders of magnitude uh, targeting um, sensitivity comparable with a uh, PET sensitivity, keeping the advantage to be non-invasive, no side effect, no radiation effect. Uh, maybe a last point. So here I was talking about uh, capability of imaging of diamonds themselves. Uh, together with a uh, team of uh, Valery Davidov at Moscow Institute of uh, High Pressure Physics of Russian Academy of Sciences, we are working on um, creating a core shell structures in diamond that allow you to transfer polarization from a nano diamond to via spin diffusion through dense carbon 13 layer to outside spins. Um, and that can be interesting in terms of imaging not only in nano diamonds themselves in the body, but to transfer polarization to a proteins or to metabolic uh, molecules outside via diffusion of uh, spins from the in V center region. To, to outside in this, in this shell. And uh, uh, the first experiment showed that this synthesis is possible, this kind of a core shell particle, I call it core shell, but all particle is a diamond, but a core is a C12 diamond, not having too many nuclear spins, and shell is a C13 diamond, having 100% nuclear spins, facilitating diffusion of spins, and uh, so these core shell particles have been synthesized starting from the core to be about uh, 20 nanometers here shown on the left and after overgrowth. So the size increases and this overgrowth is done in C13 enriched medium, um, having a basically very dense spin layer um, uh, consisting diamond. Uh, we also can check these particles uh, in NMR spectrometer and we can see that uh, most of the signal of C13 is really originating from the core, uh, from the shell, uh, and is broadening the load by dipole dipole interaction between uh, nuclear spins. These nuclear spins also do have quite a long T1 time 
on the order of a few minutes even, uh, allowing you to transfer polarization over quite a distance to uh, be able to transfer it from the core to the outside molecules. Right, with this, I would like to uh, summarize my presentation and also uh, give you some uh, maybe a uh, few uh, words about uh, future impact in the, of this field. So we know nowadays how to detect uh, a small number of molecules or even single molecules using NV centers. Uh, and in future, uh, so we think that uh, this demonstration experiments can be applied to answer really central questions in biochemistry and biology and medicine, uh, apply this to unknown proteins, apply it to understand metabolic processes using NMR, or even applying to making better MRI imaging. Uh, all these experiments so far have been performed in um, university labs. It's of course uh, not yet uh, a technology and so transfer to technology. Uh, it's also very important and here uh, several industrial players are already active in this field. I mentioned at our company at Ulm University and Vision, but there is also other big players in sensing technologies that are getting active in the field of quantum sensing using NV centers, uh, including uh, Bosch. Uh, you see here the uh, integrated diamond magnetometers that was uh, realized in Bosch labs, and they are now working on getting better and better sensitivity of these magnetometers. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, I was discussing a lot about the hardware, how to build the better uh, sensors out of NV centers by uh, placing them closer or making better diamonds. Uh, but also signal analysis and coherent control tools are very important. And uh, better magnetometry is also better signal processing. And here, machine learning can be very efficient uh, and first demonstrations uh, are already published in, in this area. For this, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, our team at Institute of Quantum Optics and all, and our collaborators uh, for contributions to this work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Father, for the wonderful talk. It's a very uh, beautiful summary and also perspective uh, for this quantum sensing field. Uh, so I noticed this uh, this uh, device from Bush is very small, right? Is that based on the optical detection of MV centers? Uh, uh, are there detectors uh, integrated there? Uh, yes, so uh, it is very small and it's even first generation. So this device is uh, uh, from uh, this first publication and now they have a smaller device and indeed detector is integrated here. Uh, detectors and light source is integrated, uh, microwave antenna. The only thing that is not integrated is microwave source in, in this first generation. So there is microwave line going in. Um, and uh, well, there is of course also some um, data acquisition electronics, just the voltage that was detected, but all the essential elements, source of light, diamond and detector are inside of this, uh, this small, uh, device. Okay, that's a uh, very beautiful already to <laughs> detect. Uh, I yeah, guess and so this is a first generation. The second one is even smaller than this, like yeah, at least factor of ten. So they are based on the ensemble to detect the external magnetic field, not for bio application. Yeah, so this is uh, currently uh, ensembles of NV centers and. Uh, it's more to detect uh, magnetic fields and more like uh, microscopic scale. Uh, this is not for nanoscale, this device. But we hope that uh, similar devices can be also done even for nanoscale sensing. There is nothing preventing it. But just, of course, more, more integration work is needed. Yeah, thanks. So any uh, questions from the audience? I noticed today we have uh, quite a lot of audience. Yeah, I, I had one small, uh, small question. Um, so, 
so you just said that you know you could bring it down to nanoscale um, resolution. Uh, what kind of scales are you talking about here, and you know what's the timeline like uh, um, for, for for making that happen? Are, are you talking about say tens of nanometers, or are you actually talking about um, um, uh, nanometer scales? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very important question. So thank you uh, for posing it. Um, so the sensing here, I, I can maybe illustrate it on this slide, is based on a dipole-dipole interaction between NV center and uh, the molecule of interest or the nuclear spin of interest. And this dipole-dipole interaction scales as a third power of the distance, essentially saying that uh, you, are, you are sensing uh, the volume which is defined more or less by standoff distance, uh, that by distance between the V-center and the surface. So if I have, for example, a molecule that is uh, uh, located two nanometers close to in V-center, then the fragment of molecule to, that is four nanometer far away, imagine molecule is like two nanometer across, uh, will have only 10% contribution. So the 90% will come from the closest part and only 10% from, from a far away part because of the uh, third power <laughs> dependence. So it uh, says that uh, the volume itself is more or less the standoff distance. Uh, now, how close you can get your NV center to the surface, so it's still an open question, but what we know that we can get it up to two nanometer deep. So you can reach about two nanometer uh, special resolution in this uh, respect directly. But and now part of the question is, can you do better than this? So this is basically just a sense in volume. Can you separate nuclear spin within this two nanometer distance? And uh, the, the, this is also some, uh, some topic of ongoing projects. So you can use it actually in vCenter as a small magnet and make kind of slices inside of molecule to resolve uh, individual nuclear spins in frequency domain, and because you know the gradient, uh, you can also then associate distances with these uh, frequencies. A little bit like a MRI, but on a nano scale. I see. I see. And, and, and is all of this stuff done in a scanning mode in which you kind of, you know, mm -hmm. move, a, say, a tip kind of in an, a, with a piezo or something that you kind of move across the sample? Um, or, or, or are you just kind of um, you only have a single um, thing, and what's what's the what's the mode of operation? Uh, in our experiment here, mode of operation was more static, uh, so we were not scanning, and this also posed the limits, namely how far you can see. So you can nicely see the closest part of the molecule, but you can hardly see uh, on a wide range, uh, and uh, so. In order to go to uh, larger areas, but still keep this nanoscale resolution, you would need a scanning probe. And there are groups working on scanning probe, like measuring uh, some environment uh, a few nanometers around NV center, then move uh, your NV center to next uh, a neighboring place, measure another area, and, and so on and so on. That can be done. Uh, it's, of course, time consuming. Uh, but that's uh, also important development to to be able to measure, for example, large molecules. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, any other questions? Please feel free to uh, ask your questions. Yeah, so further, I have another question. Actually, the uh, NV center is so sensitive, it can detect the several protons or in the single protons. Actually, many applications in medical, they don't need such a sensitivity, right? So they, for example, if you want to detect some virus, some bacteria, so uh, what they need is uh, actually to detect a large amount and then uh, to detect the single virus, for example, for them is very good already. So why do you think uh, we are not going for that direction? Or are there people going for that direction already, for example, to tackle real problems for the COVID-19, let's say? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's a very important uh, question to, uh, to find different application area and different scales. 
Uh, and in some cases, you want to detect really a, maybe a single molecule, a single proton. In other case, um, you allow yourself to have more molecules, may maybe detect more reliably. Uh, and I think in both cases, in V centers can be interesting. Uh, I think at some point in terms of NMR, uh, you will start to compete with coils, micro coils. So I think that once the um, sensing volume is getting large enough, uh, then uh, coils start to be competitive. And this uh, region uh, is about like a, on a millimeter, maybe 100 micron scale. Uh, so if you want to be better than 100 micron, like in a layer, uh, they are in V centers are competitive. Uh, if you go to larger volumes, then I think we need to see whether the microcoil is alternative. Or in some cases, even you know some other quantum sensors, like for example, atomic vapor sensors in the cells, uh, or squid magnetometers in some cases. Of course, squids are technically challenging, but if you allow yourself a stand of distance, like the thickness of the glass in a cell, then atomic magnetometers can be interesting alternative. And so I think, uh, so color centers and diamond are good um, in the applications related to NMR or magnetic resonance in general, in a scale where the sensing volume need to be smaller than 100 micron. Yes, that's true. So the atomic uh, macro, uh, magnetometry is uh, more sensitive, but you need a large volume. You need a large volume or you, you cannot get so close. So you need a wall uh, uh, of the glass uh, between your sensor and the sample. And so here you can get very, very close. So that's the difference. Right, right. Uh, thanks. Any other questions from the uh, audience? Uh, Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah. So this uh, polarization transfer. So basically, that's uh, the direction your company, the Envision, is uh, going forwards. Or this uh, to use the MV centers to assist the uh, sensitivity for the MRI and uh, other things. Um, yeah. So it's. Uh, oh, you, the company. Of the company to uh, to use. Uh, polarization for novel uh, or hyperpolarization for novel biosensing and among other uh, techniques. So they are using NV centers and they're also using NV centers for NMR detection, exactly. So they are not only focused on uh, NV centers, but they're also using NV centers and they're also using NV centers for detection. So this kind of a tool of NV center is important also in this technology. So the vision is to really push it towards uh, the bio applications? Even to medical applications, yeah. To medical. MRI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good to see that uh, the spin offs are coming up, uh, your company and Harvard company, and so. Mm -hmm. uh, and any questions? So uh, I think it's uh, roughly the time already. So if uh, there is uh, no other questions, let's thank uh, Professor Fida Jellico again. Thanks to come to our uh, for coming to our seminar series, and thank you for the wonderful talk. Thank you very much for opportunity to share results. Uh, it's a pleasure to give a seminar. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So further, if you have some time, I uh, uh, maybe you can stay for some minutes. We can have a talk about mm -hmm. uh, um, the workshops we will have uh, later on. Mm -hmm. um, Justin, we.